All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Let's Talk Maine Seafood. Uh, my name is Samuel Belknap. I'm a community development officer, senior community development officer at the Island Institute, and I lead our climate and energy and our marine economy work. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today for this exciting, informative uh, discussion around Maine seafood. So today we'll be hearing from three friends of the Island Institute, each with their own unique roles in the marine economy. Now, the pandemic has brought many challenges to our coast and, and we've been getting questions from people about what can I do to help? Uh, my favorite fishermen or island community or the people that are part of my community. And the short answer is eat more Maine seafood. The Island Institute is bringing together three industry experts to encourage you to make Maine seafood a part of your go-to comfort food menu. So before we jump into the amazing content that we have today, I just wanna review a few Zoom protocol items. Today's webinar is being recorded so that we can share today's presentations with others. All of the attendees will be kept on silent mode for the entire virtual event. And if you have a question for us in the next hour, we encourage you to use the question and answer button in the lower portion of your screen and type in questions at any time. We'll try to answer as many as, many as we can during the webinar, but we'll uh, follow up by email if we're unable to get to all of them in the time that we have together. We will not be using the chat function today to ask questions, but please chat with the Island Institute staff if you run into any technical issues today during the webinar. Uh, please remember to reserve all of your questions to the Q&A tab so we can keep everything organized and make sure we can get to all that we can. Now, please, please note that everyone who is pre-registered for this event and provided us with an email address will receive a recording of today's presentation along with other helpful information and links. So by pre-registering today and attending this webinar, you are also eligible for some prizes that we'll be giving away throughout our hour together. If great recipes weren't enough reason to join us today, we'll be giving away cookbooks, t-shirts, and of course, lobster. You must be present to win, so stick around and, and stay with us for the entire event. And now I'd like to invite our panelists to come off um, mute and start their video and introduce you to today's centerpieces. Bree, we're going to start with you and we'll go Bree, Luke, and Barton. So Bree, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm Bree Warner. Some of you may have uh, known me from um, having worked at the Island Institute a few years ago, um, working on their economic development programming. And what I'm doing now came directly out of that in that at the time, um, at the Island Institute, we were really looking at the coast of Maine and working with fishermen to think about diversifying in aquaculture. And we know that mussels are expensive to get into, oysters are timely to get into and use different areas of the water and the same season as lobster. Seaweed is grown in the off season and is an absolutely viable alternative income source um, during it to help fishermen adapt to climate change while mitigating some of its effects by actually removing carbon and nitrogen from the water. But the problem at the time was there was no company in the United States that was buying large amounts of seaweed. So we made a strategic investment at the Island Institute into a company called Ocean Approved, which happened to be the first commercial seaweed farm in the country and we're working with them to help build their supply chain to work with fishermen as a way to expand their supply chain and for our purposes at the Island Institute, find viable supplemental income sources for fishermen who wanted to grow kelp, but weren't necessarily interested in raising millions of dollars to uh, create a processing facility and market and sell kelp. So after working with the company for about a year, there was a founder transition here. I was asked to take over in 2018 and the rest is where we are right now with Atlantic Sea Farms, which is our new brand. Um, we currently are in Saco, Maine. We are the first um, and only fresh kelp company in the United States at scale. We work now with 24 partner farmers up and down the coast, 21 of whom are fishermen that use this as a diversified income source. The others who are other people who work on the water like mussel growers or um, mooring businesses as a way to diversify their income as well. So the great part about kelp is it goes into the water sometime between November and December and comes out of the water between April and June. And for those of you who know the lobster industry, you know that that is completely inverse of the, of the inshore industry for lobster. 
Moreover, kelp is best farmed when using what we call the tractors of the sea, which are just lobster boats. Um, and it uses much of the same other equipment that lobstermen are using in their everyday work. So they're getting a supplemental income source, uh, they're growing in their off season, and then here's the best part, they're removing carbon and nitrogen from the water, which we found through studies with Bigelow Laboratories and work with the Island Institute, uh, reduces ocean acidification so significantly under the kelp halo that shell bearing organisms like mussels are about two times as strong um, from that decreased acidity in the water that the kelp is removing over a five month period. So this is great for the environment, it's great for adaptation. And now the question for us was, all right, so how do you sell it? Like we know it's really good uh, for the environment, for the coast, but how do we sell it? And so we've been answering that problem for about two and a half years now, doing all fresh kelp that's competing with the fact that 98% of the seaweed that we eat in the United States is imported dried from Asia. And a fresh product is our answer to that. Because if you take a piece of dried kale or let's say a raisin, it's not the same as the fresh product. And that's our value proposition here. That and the fact that we're growing everything in the clean cold waters of Maine versus many of the products that are coming in from Asia that have a very high heavy metal content. So we have been producing several products over the last two and a half years and moving them through fast casual chains from the East Coast all the way out to California. Um, as well as restaurants and now also available in retail. We're national in Sprouts starting in June. We'll also be national with Whole Foods, I'm sorry, in January, national with Whole Foods in April. And right now, if you're in New England, down in New York or anywhere in California, you can find them at Natural, natural and Co-op Grocers and several five to 15 chain locations. And you can check out our store finder at AtlanticSeaFarms.com for more about that. Um, but so that's that's basically what we're doing here uh, at Atlantic Sea Farms. We're really proud of the mission that we've accomplished. Our partner farmers range from Portland to Eastport. So if you're along the coast, if you see a kelp farm this winter, um, it's likely ours. We produce around 95% of the seaweed that comes out of the water here in the state of Maine. So I'd love to take any questions, but what I did for a video was try to um, use my ultimate hubris of both doing a cooking video with Barton Seaver on the line, but also trying to make a lobster roll with Luke Holden on the line because I thought I would just kind of like go for it. Um, but I, I made a, a lobster roll with kelp butter and that's one of the easiest ways that you can use fresh kelp. So over to you, Sam, for the video. Great. I think we're going to wait a second for you before we jump into the videos okay. and just give Luke and Barton a chance to introduce themselves um, before your delicious lobster roll steals the show. So Luke, <laughs> introduction, yourself, please. Yeah, Sam, thanks for having me today. Um, and it's, a, it's an honor to be on here with, with Bree. Bree, I think you're such an inspirational leader. Um, it's really it's remarkable what you've been able to do. And Barton, you are just an icon in the sustainable seafood world. So uh, fun to share the, the stage with you guys. Um, so my name is Luke Holden. I'm a third generation lobsterman. My father was the first licensed lobster processor here in the state of Maine. So naturally I grew up on the back of boats and in the working waterfront and in his production facilities. And I developed a, uh, uh, an addiction to this disease that is the lobster industry at a very, very early age and um, returned to it back in 2009 uh, when I opened up the first Luke's Lobster Shack back in uh, um, the East Village of Manhattan. And it was really just engineered to be a no frills, uh, super high quality, affordable main style lobster roll where I got to just kind of partner with dad and uh, started the business 50-50 and just do something that we were passionate about. Like buy his lobster crab and shrimp and sell it some really good rolls and source some chowders and bisques from Maine and just do something I cared about. Um, at the time I was doing investment banking work and that was fine, but I didn't really care about it. So um, Luke's was a big hit, uh, especially with, with um, uh, the millennial demographic. And then uh, at 2009, there was this big, this big uh, movement um, to kind of go from Wall Street to Main Street. And there was this nice little drum roll beat of press and excitement and, and attention. And my team just did such a, an incredible job uh, delivering this product and this service that we were able to open up a second location just five months later. 
And that's when I actually left the bank and started doing this full time. Um, kind of fast forward to, to, to today, and I might mix today with, with pre-pandemic stats because today is uh, uh, a little bit rocky for us, but we're, we're a vertically integrated business. Um, we buy uh, lobster, crab, and shrimp um, predominantly from co-ops um, that we partner with up and down the coast of Maine. Um, and throughout um, Atlanta, Canada, Canada, we produce, we also process here in Saco, Maine, and um, we sell uh, through a couple different channels. We've got uh, somewhere around 40 restaurants uh, globally that we own and, and manage. Um, and then we've got uh, a wonderful e-commerce business that we were building in partnership with the Island Institute. Um, and then we've got a big uh, CPG business, consumer packaged good business, where Whole Foods, similar to Breeze Business, is um, really the star of our uh, of our customer base. And we're selling everything from lobster roll kits to lobster tail kits to lobster mac and cheese, lobster bisque, uh, Jonah crab claw kits, and lobster cakes. And um, we're very proud of that. And uh, really, we're at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is just be good stewards of, of the sustainable, traceable products that are caught here in, um, in, in the Gulf of Maine. And, and anytime we can take a primary ingredient and get it to a, a, a consumer's hand and create value for it um, under our B Corp ethos, uh, we, we, we find that to be a tremendous win. So we like to keep it simple and just add value in, in, in a long-term thinking way as, uh, as we possibly can. Great, thank you so much, Luke. Barton. Hey everyone. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much uh, to the entire team at the Island Institute. Uh, there are a few organizations anywhere that I admire as much as uh, what y'all are doing there and, and what I've learned from you. Bree, Luke, uh, I appreciate the compliments from you, but right back at you. My name is Barton Siever. I am a storyteller, uh, author, recovering chef, restaurateur, amongst other things. Uh, but the key facet of my career is that I need good stories to tell. And well, Maine is full of them. Uh, and uh, on me, with me, with me on this panel are two of the very best. So thank you for having me be a part of this. So I am a resident of this proud, delicious, jagged coast uh, that we call home in Maine. I live down at South Freeport. My family has got uh, two little boys, a four-year-old and a four-month-old. The four-month-old is likely to wake up at any time now because he's across the room. And my cat is likely to walk across the screen. This is reality. This is where we are these days. Uh, I lived and worked all over the world. I come from Washington, DC, my home state not a state, but home state. And I took my wife's hand and followed her back home to her home state of Maine uh, after Johnson, Boston and all over the world. So I worked as a chef, uh, notably for Jose Andres, uh, running his flagships in Washington DC before stepping out on my own, got very interested in sustainable seafood and then took a turn as an explorer with the National Geographic Society, which is as, you, it is as sexy of a job as you can imagine it being. Uh, my job was to go somewhere, do something, come back and tell somebody about it. And oh, by the way, I got paid for it. Yeah, it was awesome. But the great thing about going everywhere in the world and seeing so much is the blessing of knowing where you want to be. And I want to be right here because everything that I value in the world is on display here. Everything that I value in the world is, is valued here. There's no sense, no place with a greater sense of piety and of trust and of neighborliness than Maine. And if you break down this concept, complicated idea of what is sustainability, uh, well, the ideas are very complex, but the action of is very simple, and that is of being a good neighbor. And well, we know that that is the backbone of how we get through this life here in Maine is because of, our, because of each other. And so that is why I'm proud to be here and proud to be in support of such great neighbors, such as panelists, as well as Island Institute. So I look forward to cooking with y'all. Thanks. Martin, thank you so much. I think the, that description sums up the reason why we're all together today and sets the tone for this ex exciting opportunity to dive into some of our neighbors cooking. So Bree, before we get to your video, I wanted to follow up on the great context that you laid out around kind of kelp and kelp aquaculture in Maine with a couple questions. So when people think of Maine seafood, why, why should they include kelp in their thinking and what are its health benefits and, and also, um, what are some of the other issues that are around um, 
aquaculture in, in the state and, and um, some challenges that fishermen may find when they're thinking about engaging in kelp aquaculture. And you're muted still. Bringing you on mute is something that I hear four times a day and I'm really sorry that I'm not getting better at that. Um, so I, uh, there's a lot of reasons to eat kelp. I mean, I think the cool thing for us is that we can kind of meet people where they are with our messaging because there are so many different reasons that people are compelled to eat the food that they do. But first and foremost, it's about taste, right? I mean, you can hook people on uh, the fact that it's great for the environment, it's great for, for our coast, but that doesn't actually matter if it doesn't taste good. So the first reason is because it's really good for you and it tastes great. We have several different products like our seaweed kimchi, which is for folks who something, like something a little bit more taste forward. It's fermented, it's got tons of nutrients in it. And that ranges a number of like fermented seaweed salad kraut all the way to kelp cubes, which are for smoothies. So we have kind of this whole range of products that gets people to be able to use just a little bit of kelp in their food. And it's one of the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. Highest amount of calcium per ounce, potassium, iodine, one of the only natural sources of iodine that we eat in a normal diet. Um, but then taking down from like the taste and the nutrition point, so much of the food that we eat, all of the food that we eat has some sort of effect on the planet around us. And kelp has a positive effect a net positive effect. It, it helps the water. It's grown with no arable land, no fresh water, no additives, no pesticides, and is regenerative agriculture in just about every way possible, let alone the fact that it's one of the most efficient ways to grow food. We can grow about five pounds of seaweed on one foot of line in the water. So this year, you know, with uh, 16, because we have 24 farmers, but 16 four acre farms about uh, we'll be growing around 950,000 pounds of food, which is just, and there's no waste on any of that. We're using every single part of the plant. So those are all the reasons to eat kelp. Now with lobstermen, they have a lot less barriers to getting into it than other people because they have the social capital on the coast. They have the boats. The capital barrier to entry is low, um, but also they know not where not to put their farms and where not to conflict with other gear. So it's much easier for them, but uh, it's also a winter crop, so it doesn't actually have any crossover with gear. Great, Bree. Thank you so much. Now let's uh, let's dive right into it and see how you put kelp to use in your own household and what you can do it when they get home. Hi, I'm Bree Warner, the CEO of Atlantic Sea Farms, and today I'm going to do something that takes the ultimate hubris. I'm going to try to cook in my kitchen in the same segment as Barton Seaver, and I'm going to try to make lobster rolls in the same segment as Luke Holden, but here I go. The big difference today is that I will be using Atlantic Sea Farms kelp as part of a kelp butter that's going to go into the lobster roll. So what's really cool about kelp and lobster in the same dish is what we do is we work with fishermen up and down the coast as a way to diversify their income in the off season. So what does that mean? It means that they take the lobster traps out of the water, kelp lines go in, they farm that kelp until April, May, June, pull that kelp out of the water, put the lobster traps back in. So what it can really do is sort of absorb some of the shock of the volatility of being dependent on one fishery, and it produces a product that actually helps to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. And it's delicious. So what we do is all fresh kelp. We have several different products, but what I'd love to talk today about is just kind of the pure kelp products. We have our ready cut kelp, which I just showed a video, a, a um, picture of. And then we have our kelp cubes. Kelp butter can be made with either. Today I'm going to be using this ready cut kelp. And what it comes in is these four ounce packets like this. So they're just thaw and eat, ready to eat as is. So I'm going to let me heat up my butter here. So I personally, I'm not from Maine originally, and I personally love to eat my lobster rolls with butter instead of mayonnaise, and I like them slightly warmed. So I'm taking this ready cut kelp about a little less than a, a little more than a quarter cup, chopping it really finely. I made some lobster last night over the grill, so I have some leftover lobster, which is, in my in my view, the best type of leftover. So I just chopped up that ready cut kelp just a little bit finer. Then what I'm gonna do is take some orange peel. I took some butter. This is all butter that it's about a half a cup butter. I whipped it. I I let it melt a little bit. Whipped it up. 
You can also just buy whipped butter or quite frankly, since we're just gonna heat it up, you can just mix it into the regular butter. But when I'm doing it with haddock or halibut or something like that and putting it in the oven, I tend to use whipped butter because I put it on right after it comes out of the oven and it melts on this great umami taste. And that's the thing about kelp, is the best thing about it is it does impart everything with an umami taste without having to add any sort of um, seasonings or anything like that. And it's super nutrient dense, so it's got more calcium than a cup of milk. It's got um, more potassium, iodine. It's just this sort of like super nutritious thing. So lobster's good for you. We all know that butter has quite a bit of fat in it, but we'll just ignore that while we're eating the rest of something healthy. So I just heated up the leftover lobster right in here, if you can see it. Just a little bowl of lobster. My kids are all outside right now um, cleaning up for the fall, so I'm hoping that I can get this made and eaten before they come in and try to eat it themselves. So that's actually just the butter. I just take some orange peel, some salt, kelp, mix it together. Then I'll melt it on this lobster. And I think, again, the thing is I'm doing this on lobster today, but it's very easy to do on any fish. I also like to put it on like a toasted baguette piece with, um, you know, tinned fish on the side. Um, you know, a lot of people put it on pasta, like a clam pasta, which is excellent as well. So now I'm just heating it up. Get a new spoon. And that's about it. This is why I had the ability to have the hubris of cooking today, because I knew I was making a super simple recipe. And I understand this will be posted, but really just go out and buy that ready-cut kelp and you can put it in anything. You can buy it at Wegmans, you can buy it at Whole Foods, you can buy it at natural and co-op grocers across the country. All right, that smell. Like I said, what is really great about this versus just regular butter is it has that umami taste. So here it is in the pan. And then I just take it, this lobster roll um, is actually from Evenhide in Portland. They have these great buns and we buy a ton of them at once at their online grocer and freeze them so we can have lobster rolls whenever. So there it is, kelp lobster roll. And I'm gonna now enjoy this. Bree, thank you so much. That looks delicious. And in the spirit of, of sharing, um, we want to make sure uh, at least one member of our, of our audience today gets to experience some of Atlantic Sea Farm's delicious products firsthand. And I think it's, it's, it's really informative um, in the spirit of people wanting to help out their local fishermen. What is the best time of year to eat Maine lobster? So really, it's 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 October November where the, the heavy landings in Maine are uh, um, are, are experienced in our fishery. So go out and get some lobster now. Great, thank you so much, Luke. So your brand promise at Luke's Lobster is about traceable and sustainable seafood. What do those means? What do those words mean to consumers? So at Luke's, we like to partner with the source. And that is, at the end of the day, like we're trying to create win-wins with, with our fishermen, with our co-ops. We want to create value and then share in that value with those fishermen and those co-ops. And often there's initiatives around uh, reducing shrink and increasing, increasing quality that are, that are quantifiable and you can, and you can uh, numerically share in that upside with fishermen. But, but then you need the flip side of that, the storytellers like, like Barton that help us go out and create value with, with customers across the, across the world. So where we're, where this, where this is trending is since 2009 to present day, there's just a much larger percentage of consumers that want to know where their, where their food's coming from. They want, they want to know what, that it's, it's traceable back to a sustainable resource. And, and at Luke's, we're dedicated to not sourcing any seafood that's not coming from a sustainable resource. And we prove that through traceability. 
Thank you so much, Luke. Now, I know all of us at the Institute missed heading down to Tenants Harbor and, and popping by Luke's chat uh, because of the pandemic. Everyone's facing challenges because of this, this um, tragedy. What is Luke's Lobster doing to address the challenges put forth by the, the global pandemic? It's definitely been a bummer. Um, at one point in time, we had all but one shack closed. I had to furlough 90% of my team, um, which is either my family or an extension of my family. Um, and we've had to deal with clusters of infections in our production facility and in restaurants and everyone's recovered and safe, but um, it's, it's, been, it's been a real challenge. Um, I think uh, we've been fortunate enough to, to have a, a monthly column in Main Mag and um, the last month uh, column was really about appreciation and appreciation for the team. I, I've just been incredibly humbled and, and grateful for, for how the team has come together in the last six to nine months to, to work through this pandemic in a way that it keeps this business, uh, which is very important for, for the industry and, and all the stakeholders that we serve, solvent and forward thinking and not making any short-term decisions so that, so that we, have a, we have a meaningful place in, in, in the leadership of our industry in the future. Right, and Luke, I would encourage you to take a look through the, the chat. There's some really wonderful things coming in about their favorite locations of yours were nearest to them. So it's a testament to the quality of product and the dedication to sustainability that you have at Luke's. Thank you so much. So diving into your, uh, your video, I hear you had a little bit of extra help in the kitchen. So um, let's take a look at that. Hey, I'm Luke, and this is Poppy. We're coming uh, fresh off of Halloween last night. But today we're gonna to be making lobster stew. I'm not much of a chef. She's actually quite good, um, especially for a two-year-old, right? You pretty good chef? Yeah. But what we believe in here is just really high quality ingredients and simple recipes. And the recipe that we're making today for lobster stew is just some really good ingredients and just keeping it super simple. All right. So Poppy and I have melted eight tablespoons of salted butter. We're gonna layer in two teaspoons of sea salt. And we've got two pounds of lobster meat. <coughs> yep. Um, this lobster is coming from New Shell Lobsters. And what we had to do at Luke's, at our production facility, was actually produce um, 10 lobsters. 10 new shell lobsters to get um, the equivalent of two pounds of lobster meat. That's what, about what the yield is on new shell lobsters, five to one. So um, two pounds of lobster meat into our lobster salt butter base. We've got two teaspoons of sherry that we're also gonna layer in. And then we're gonna go back to the stove and we're just gonna heat all of this for about five minutes before we add cream and milk, all right? So we're just mixing and warming for about five minutes. The key here is that you don't wanna boil. Everything has already been cooked, so we're just reheating. Do we have people coming over today? Yeah. And what, what are they coming over for? Well, they're coming over for lobster, yes, but what's the real reason they're coming over? Because it's Banks' one-year-old birthday, right? Yeah, and Poppy. Oh, and Poppy. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna get some cake too. Yeah. <laughs> so this serving today, we've got eight family members coming over and we figure that this ought to be a, a healthy portion for eight people. So we've got our two pounds of lobster meat, our eight tablespoons of butter, two teaspoons of sherry, two teaspoons of sea salt, and we're gonna add two cups of whole milk, right, mm -hmm. Poppy? Go ahead. Nice, good job. And then we're gonna add two pints of light cream. I'm gonna put these in too, kiddo. Go ahead. Nice job. Oh, 
all the way. Nice. One more. Oh. This looks yummy, huh? Yeah, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Yum. Good job. All right. So now we will just cook all this low heat 15 minutes and we'll be ready to eat. Right, Pops? Stir it up a little bit. Gentle. Nice. Good job. I'm here with the birthday girl. She just woke up from her nice little afternoon nap. Mm. Yeah, while you were sleeping, we made you some lobster stew. Oh, look at that color. So it's been on a low simmer for 15 minutes. It looks perfect. It's just got that very delicate new shell Maine lobster, the perfect ingredient. Do you think you're gonna like this? Think your friends are gonna like this? Yeah, I think so too. Thanks for watching today. Luke, that looked absolutely delicious. And I have to say, there's nothing better than finding great helpers in the kitchen. So Luke, in response to the pandemic, a lot of effort has gone into uh, shifting lobster towards home sales. Do you think that has the potential to expand markets when life gets back to normal? It absolutely does. Um, so pre-pandemic, 80% of the seafood in the U.S. was consumed through restaurants. And I, I think the biggest reason for that is not access, but it's just this it's, it's the general effort that we all have to make to demystify seafood. I think generally speaking, people don't know what to do with it in the comfort of their own kitchen. So there's a lot of direct to consumer brands and businesses that have refocused their efforts uh, to sell direct to the consumer and demystify seafood. And I think that that's just going to create more value and more awareness around more value for the industry and, and, and more awareness around what you can do in the, in the comfort of your own kitchen going forward. Great, thank you so much, Luke. So Luke, just a quick question. I'm not sure if you have an answer, but kind of opening this up to all of our panelists, uh, a question that's near and dear to my heart. I have a son that has a, a dairy intolerance. So does anyone have any ideas about how to, how to make a delicious lobster stew in lieu of milk or cream? Barton, any creative ideas? Sure. Uh, you're going to have to incorporate a, a little bit of a different flavor, but certainly going with a coconut unsweetened, of course, coconut milk, uh, coconut cream. Uh, it's going to be a lot richer, so I would leave out a lot of the butter that was in there. You still want some of the butter because the classicness of that flavor. Uh, but as long as you're not adding ginger, lemongrass, garlic, the Southeast Asian flavors, coconut milk uh, will actually, it will allow you to still feel like you're in New England, just a little bit, a uh, little bit of cayenne in there. Uh, someone else had, had commented on that um, about their family recipe having a little cayenne. So that's what I recommend. Simmer it in the watery part of the coconut milk and then add the cream in just at the very end over no heat uh, because it will break uh, over high heat. Great, that sounds delicious, Barton. So Luke, you mentioned the yield on some of your uh, lobster meat. How long does it take a professional to, to get all of the meat out of a lobster? This is kind of a wild statistic, but on, an, on any given production day, we average about 40,000 pounds of, of live lobster production. And so that's probably roughly 35,000 lobsters. Each lobster has approximately two claws, so 70,000 claws. We have 22 pickers that will extract the meat from those 75,000 claws in about a six hour shift. It's wildly efficient and a beautiful artisanal uh, handcraft skill that uh, it would take me years to, to, uh, to accomplish anything remotely close to that volume. Um, it's, they're very, very skilled, uh, very, very skilled workers. That's quite impressive. So um, a question for all three of you, but really targeted for Luke and Bree, where in the mid coast can you get the kelp products and some of your lobster products, Luke? Luke, we'll start with you. 
And Mid Coast, I mean, we have a wonderful shack on uh, in Tenants Harbor that uh, we just elected not to reopen this year. Uh, but that's down at Ten Tenants Harbor Fisherman's Co-op, and ordinarily that's open seasonally and just a, a great source of, um, of 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 our uh, our, our full menu. Um, but but generally speaking, you're going to have to come south to either the Whole Foods that's located in Portland or our uh, flagship. Uh, restaurant, which is on Portland Pier, uh, and open year round in Portland. And for us, we are we actually have our kelp in most place, most natural grocers that you can find in the mid coast area. Partially because we have such a strong farming community up there, and uh, they bug us until we get it into the stores up there. Because all of our all of our products have an ambassador on the back, the name of the fisherman, the face of the fisherman. And uh, so if you're out on North Haven, uh, you might only find the kelp cubes because I think Karen Cooper out there has made it so hers is the only one that's on any of the shelves. Um, but you can basically find it in any of the local and co-op grocers or national food stores anywhere in the mid coast. I'll give a shout out to my local rising tide here in Damariscotta. I pop down there at least once a week to grab some sea chi. So Barton. We've used the word sustainability quite a bit. And uh, in your video that we're about to watch, you say the, that diversity is the cornerstone, cornerstone of sustainability. As a chef, author, educator, and self-proclaimed storyteller, how would you describe the diversity of Maine seafood? Uh, well, certainly we're seeing some of the diversity of it represented here today uh, and some of the diversity that we're going to see. So there's two, uh, well, I think there's really three chapters to that story. The first chapter of that is that for hundreds of years, uh, even the founding of this country, which, you know, uh, whatever your Thanksgiving narrative is that you, uh, you describe to, the bottom line is that we set foot here on this continent because of cod. Uh, and that it was upon the backs of cod that we took our first steps towards political and economic freedom uh, and everything else. Since then, we have become an agrarian nation. We turned away from the tempestuous waves of the North Atlantic towards a, a, a different ocean that ripples with amber waves of grain. We have forgotten a lot of that heritage, but our economy was based on cod. Uh, and as we all know, that has become a sorrowful tale. It has been a you know, boom to bust uh, sort of narrative. And I think the present day narrative of diversity is that, hey, now we're looking around and seeing well, what opportunities do we have to sustain the fleet, uh, you know, in whatever form it is still in. And the answer is, well, all of the fish that we never caught uh, for economic value in the past. So that's the haddock and the hake and the cusk and the ling and the skate and the monk and the wolf and the dog and the eel and the ray and the pout and the place and the dabs and the witchbacks and the flounders and all of these other fish that are available here that should we as consumers find appetite for uh, could revolutionize and sustain a lot of the infrastructure that is currently here. Sort of picking up on the narrative woven from our past. Uh, and then diversity also encourages us to think to the future, you know, and that's what Brie has done so incredibly well is what is the future of this place? What does climate change look like? What are not only efforts we can undertake to mitigate climate change, but also to create adaptive reactive systems that utilize existing infrastructure to strengthen what really matters here in Maine, which is the endurance of thriving human communities, uh, you know, and, and Kudos to Luke as well for doing the same thing of finding that extra value in the products that are already here. And so diversity is not just multiformity, but diversity is also multiple lenses to look at the products that are already in front of us. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we're showing everyone your video last because as a professional chef, you're, you're a hard act to follow. So let's see what you've cooked up for our viewers today. Hey everyone, my name is Barton Siever. I'm a chef, author, father, husband, and a resident here of this jagged, ragged, delicious coast of Maine. And I'm thrilled to be joining you tonight in support of the Island Institute and their incredible mission, as well as to 
well, to be here in support of my friends and neighbors and colleagues who are, well, utilizing Maine's greatest natural resources, the tastiness in our ocean, as well as the work ethic of our people here, uh, well, to bring to the table uh, the elements of a thriving Maine economy. And one of the dishes that I love to do is uh, one that showcases the versatility of the seafood we have. Now, I'm just going to get started here on the dish. Now, this is a, a puttanesca uh, braised seafood. I'm going to get started on this and then tell you a little bit about, well, some thoughts on seafood and sustainability and elsewise. But this is a simple Italian preparation. Uh, you likely have a lot of the ingredients in your pantry already. If not, they're, well, they're super easy to source. I mean, as difficult as things get, we're talking about a tin of anchovies, some black olives, some garlic, capers, etc. But with braised seafood, the dish that we're making here, I like to, well, it's important to start off with really developing a deeply flavored base. Because seafood cooks relatively quickly, we don't have the time that we have per se with like a, well, beef stew that slow layering of flavors, the complexity over time. Seafood cooks so quickly, so we really need to layer in those flavors and make the base flavorful to begin with. So what I've gotten here, just in a steep sided saute pan, I've got a tin of anchovies with their oil, which is gonna melt down and add to the flavor. I've got quite a bit of garlic sliced. I love garlic, I really do and its flavor melts into this, as well as the anchovies. You would never ever know that they're in the dish, but for that, hmm, what is that utter deliciousness and unctuousness behind the flavor of this sauce that creates such a wonderful foundation that is unexpected and wonderful? Yeah, anchovies, folks, there you go. That's my secret go-to. And if you can see here, I actually have quite a lot of anchovies, a uh, bit of a collector of them. Anyway, we're just going to melt these ingredients down uh, over about medium-high heat. Those anchovies will dissolve, the garlic will soften, and I'm also going to add some hot chilies, which I moved to the other side of my kitchen in my vain attempt to seem organized and that my kitchen is clean in this COVID era with a three-and-a-half-month-old boy and a four-year-old and no daycare and a job and a wife that works full-time. Anyway, back to the chili flakes, here they are. So this is Griffin Ridge, another one of our neighbors doing great work. They've got these smoked Serrano chilies. I got these at Bow Street here down in Freeport where we live. So as the anchovies melt in, as this garlic softens, I'm gonna add two or three of these in. You can opt to leave them out or use crushed chili flake, whatever you wanna use. But just to give some punctuation, some, uh, you know, a little bit of bite, some piquancy to the sauce. And so as that all sautés in, you can see here that those anchovies have largely disintegrated. That's what we were hoping they would do. Those chilies are lending their flavor to the broth. I'm going to add some capers, some black olives with a little bit of their brine. What else am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to add some wine. Yeah. And by the way, yes, professional chefs, boxed wine. It's delicious. There you go. And then uh, the, can, the recipe that I've provided for you calls for two cans of, two 14 ounce cans of tomatoes, or one, uh, one large one. Now we're gonna put the tomatoes in. These are the petite diced ones, but if you can use whole crushed peeled tomatoes, whole peeled tomatoes, whatever it is. So we're just gonna bring this to a simmer and let it cook for about 10 minutes or so for those flavors to deepen, to develop, for all these ingredients to get married together and get happy and all that. And then we're gonna put the lightly seasoned fish into the pot and then throw the whole thing into the oven for about half an hour or so. And yeah, that sounds like half an hour is a lot of time for cooking fish, right? Well, yeah, but it's gonna cook low and slow, gently over the period of that time, nestled into this broth all of its uh, moisture that it cooks out of it is it exudes into the sauce itself and it just becomes one and yeah it's going to be really flaky and delightful but when you serve this whole thing over rice or roasted potatoes that fish melts into the sauce and onto your mouth and bursts with flavor right okay so this all sounds pretty good so 
here's our dish simmering away. So now let's talk about the fish, right? So the recipe, uh, well, it works very well for cod. It's a classic dish with cod. But as we know, when we drag a net through the water, a lot more comes up from it than just cod, right? There's an incredible diversity in the ocean that we need to be taking advantage of from both an economic standpoint and from a culinary standpoint. I mean, quite honestly, that we are only willing to eat cod that forces an irrational economy upon the ocean and upon the communities that derive their livelihood from it. Why? Well, if we're only eating cod, why aren't we valuing the haddock or the hake or the monk or the skater, or the wolf or the dog or the eel or the ray or pallet or the pollock or the place or the dab or the flounder or the witchback or the backpack? I mean, there are 23 different species of flaky white flesh fish in our waters alone. And then you throw in aquaculture um, options as well. And all of a sudden we're talking about this incredible culinary opportunity that we're not valuing, that we're not taking advantage of. So I believe it's our responsibility as consumers to invest in diversity because ultimately diversity is the cornerstone of sustainability from an economic standpoint. I mean, you don't have all of your money invested in just one stock, do you? I hope you don't. If you do diversify your portfolio, right? I mean, the sustainability of biology, is also predicated upon diversity. The sustainability of our society and our culture is predicated on a diversity of peoples and experiences and cultures, right? So same too should be our approach to sustainability when it comes to food systems. We need to support that diversity of opportunity and really for your own benefit of culinary discovery. So as this simmers away here, I'm gonna talk about the monkfish that I've got here. It's really uh, an underutilized, underappreciated resource in the Gulf of Maine and across the Atlantic. Now, I'm sure you've heard of monkfish. You very likely have had it before, but please go out of your way to buy more of it. I mean, it's really delicious and it would help our fishermen. So, but it's not just the monkfish. That's not what this dish is about. So I've got Monkfish braised in tomato, seasoned with capers and olives, spiced with smoked chilies, all simmered down in an aromatic white wine, garlic broth, rich with tomatoes, right? Wait, what was the fish? It doesn't matter. Whether it's farm-raised salmon, whether it's cod or pollock or hake or haddock or cusk or ling or monk or skate or wolf or dog or eel or ray or powder place or dab or flounder or witchback or blackback, I mean, it doesn't matter, folks. Buy what's freshest and best in the store, take it home, enjoy it, learn its narrative, understand how it connects us to our communities and understand how our natural resources in the water link us to, as I said earlier, our greatest natural resource in Maine, which is the work ethic of our people. And with that, I will just show that the seafood nestles into the sauce. I haven't simmered it quite 10 minutes here, but I want to respect other people's time on this uh, webinar and presentation. So just going to nestle it in. You want to make sure that the fish isn't all glummed up together. I've cut it into about one inch sections, about an ounce each beautiful presentation when it comes out. Nestle it in, just make sure it's all evenly distributed. Put a top on this thing, throw it in the whole thing in the oven for about half an hour at 275 or just simmer it on the stovetop, making sure to uh, carefully stir it every now and then. Take it out and enjoy. Serve it over rice, serve it over roast potatoes, but whatever you do as you sit down to dinner, please eat with care and be mindful that the impacts, the choices that we make have impacts on our natural world. I ask you to you know, eat with joy and consider that we are able to still participate in the bounty of our big, beautiful, mostly blue planet and ultimately eat together when COVID allows, of course, to remind us of what unites us all on this big, beautiful planet and to support those around us, our neighbors, as they sustain us. So thank you. Bon appetit. Great. Thank you so much, Barton. Uh, a hearty meal and some hearty reflection on Maine seafood. So thank you for sharing that. With us. I think, Sam, if, Sam, one thing, though, when he says it doesn't matter what fish you get, what like my favorite thing to do is run into Barton at the fist store. Like I feel like I have hit the jackpot every time that happens because he points <laughs> me towards some fish I would have never bought 
that is way better than anything I would have. So I think that's true, Bart, but also you have gotten me to chase, chase fish that I had no, would have had no idea what to do with. That's, Bree, thank you. That's a perfect segue to one of the questions I'm going to get to before we announce the winner of, of Bart and one of your cookbooks. Where can people find these diverse fishes here in Maine that uh, we should be trying? Uh, my, my Gulf of Maine sashimi, uh, Jen Levin, who was at Gulf of Maine Research Institute for many years running their seafood programs, uh, who uh, amongst all of my colleagues that I've worked with globally in that sector uh, has always been a visionary and a leader uh, and, and really just one of my favorite thinkers. And she bravely just, uh, I think much like Bree, she was working on a project through Gulf of Maine Research Institute and said, you know, somebody needs to take this forward. Somebody needs to go, go with this. And so uh, she is getting, she is using, working with Maine fishermen to promote better practices on board in terms of a Japanese Ikejime style killing method that leads to a higher quality product. So it's not about competing with North Sea cod out of Norway. It's about getting the cod that we have here in the Gulf of Maine to be of a quality that is unavailable anywhere else. Uh, but so Gulf of Maine sashimi, they're doing drop-offs as well as direct to consumer sales right now. Uh, but they're doing a whole host of different species trying to diversify. And then of course, I, I'm in South Port, I'm, I'm in South Freeport. So we have access to Harbor fish uh, right down there in you know, on the wharf and I, I love them what they do. And yes, I ran into Brie there one time and she had what, a one week old baby on her arm looking as fresh faced as anyone could because Brie's a badass. She is amazing. Great, thank you so much. Gulf of Maine sashimi. All right, we'll make sure that information gets out to all of our attendees. Well, if, if I may, I, and not Please. everyone else got to hold up their products, right? So um, I, this book is not so much a cookbook but it's a narrative tale of every single species landed in the United States, uh, richly illustrated from Winslow Homer paintings to uh, you know, Maine photographers to, I mean, it's all over. It's everything from Maine to Alaska, but the point of the book is to create that narrative. You know, we go to a farmer's market and why do we buy the, the ripe green tomato that's crunchy and acidic or the, the purple one or the fractal cauliflower that looks like some alien Rubik's cube, you know, like why? It's because we understand the civic social virtues and values of the farmer, dirty fingered, handing it to us, their labor, the first ingredient in our meal. We get that, right? And this book was written in the hopes of creating and fomenting that relationship between fishermen and the eaters of understanding that, that narrative conduit. So um, yeah. when I call myself a storyteller, this is my greatest story told. Great. Uh, so, Barton, kind of following up on that is a, a question from the audience. Um, and while I would encourage all attendees to purchase all of Barton's books, for those looking to start one of the chefs that they love down this seafood journey, could you recommend one of your books to start? Oh, uh, well, I, I, I would. Uh, so my first book called For Cod and Country uh, is, is, a, is one of my very favorite books. Uh, and what I love about the book is it's actually a book about vegetables. Uh, which is how we all need to be eating, that I'm gonna sit here and talk about seafood all day, but bottom line is we need, as humans need to be eating a plant forward, plant-based diet with small portions of sustainably produced uh, food, hopefully seafood on top of them. Um, and that, that is clear and present in that book. Uh, also vegetables make things delicious and interesting and seasonal and, and close to our hearts. Uh, but then starting off people as, as consumers and as cooks, hey, I've got a, a kid's cookbook that I published with National Geographic. Uh, start them early. Show them that food is cool. And my, my son, my four-year-old's favorite food is bluefish. His second favorite food is squid off the grill, tentacles and all. Uh, he'll eat a can of sardines in a minute It's because we told him it was cool and, uh, you know, and believed it ourselves. So That's great. Grilled hey, mackerel thanks. and kelp. Grilled mackerel and kelp for my eight-year-old. It's it's the he, he loves kelp. We pick it up off the beach and eat it. So which That's I don't, great. Yeah, for what it Wonderful. is. In other words, you go into the store and buy Atlantic Sea Farms kelp. Barton and put it on that, all of your fish. That's exactly yeah. what I said. Yeah, I, just, I think I that's what you Russian, just said. So I just I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it correctly. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So not to be outdone, uh, the Island Institute would like to give away some of our kelp is the new 
kale t-shirts that Luke featured in his video. Um, so quickly announce the winners of those. So thank you to all of our panelists. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for the camera crews that helped produce these videos. And thank you for the introducing us to your kitchen helpers as well. Um, Luke, we appreciate that. And thank you all who joined us today, joining this wonderful conversation. Now, if you pre-registered, we'll be sending you a recording of this webinar with helpful links to our panelists' websites and including information around Gulf of Maine sashimi and things like that. So you can start uh, to carry the lessons you learned here today forward on sustainable Maine seafood and in making this part of your go-to comfort food, not just during these holiday, this holiday season, but throughout the entire year, because the best time to eat lobster, kelp, or any of the fish coming out of the Gulf of Maine is right now. So I encourage you all to shop locally this holiday season, in particular shopping local for Maine seafood. And we had a list of some of the places where you can do that. Um, to set you off on this journey with our participants today, you can find kelp at AtlanticSeafarms.com. You can shop lobster and other locally sourced Maine seafood at Luke'sLobster.com. And you can order any of Barton's books and find more of his recipes online at BartonSeaver.com. You can also find cookbooks, t-shirts, kelp products, and more at the Island Institute's Archipelago store in downtown Rockland or online at thearchipelago.net. Finally, if you're not already a member of the Island Institute, I would encourage you to join. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to confront the challenges ahead for Maine's island and coastal communities. Thank you all so much for joining us today and please stay safe, stay healthy, and eat more Maine seafood. Thank you all.